Um, so now we are officially at uh, the noon hour here at Eastern Time. I'd like to introduce Mr. Yosef Lindell. I'm so happy to have him here today. He's a lawyer, a writer, and a lecturer living in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, Mr. Lindell has a JD from NYU School of Law and an MA in Jewish History from uh, history from Yeshiva University's Bernard Revel Graduate School. He is one of the editors of Lair House, an online forum for Jewish thought. Uh, Mr. Lindell's writing spans several genres, including science fiction, and he's been published in The Atlantic. Primarily, though, his writing focuses on Jewish history and thought, and he's published more than 30 articles on these topics. So we're very happy to have you here today. Um, again, this is, a, this is a meaty topic to get into, so I will uh, turn the turn the mic over to you. I'm going to go ahead, Mr. Lindell, and mute all the participants. You'll likely have to unmute yourself to get started. Thank you again to everybody for being here. Shira, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm very happy to be here speaking for Torah in Motion, and also want to thank Rabbi Kelman for the introduction ability to, to do this as well. Um, so, and uh, just a matter of housekeeping with regard to questions, I will try to stop speaking periodically and invite questions and also attend to questions in the chat at this point. So we'll do that a few times throughout the class. Um, and if for some reason there is just something you really need to ask about immediately, like also you can unmute yourself and ask me as necessary. Um, so Pesach guides. So here's how we'll begin. There's this, there's this meme that goes around online sometimes. I, I don't know, I don't know memes so well, but it's something like, this is how, it's like how it started and how's it going. So we're gonna do a little bit of that, a visual kind of how it started and how's it going meme. So this is how it's, this is how it started. This is uh, Rabbi uh, Avram Blumenkrantz. This is his Halachas of Pesach, this is his Pesach guide. This is from 1981. And how many pages is this? This is 62 pages. Okay, fairly respectable. Okay, how it's going. 2020, Rabbi Avram Blumenkrantz's Pesach Guide, um, 581 pages. Well, that's a pretty big change. <laughs> it's gotten a lot longer. So one might surmise, if the guides are getting a lot longer, they're also getting a lot stricter. Uh, I'm certainly reminded of a very famous article that was published in Tradition in 1994 that you'll see here on your source sheet in source number one by Dr. Chaim Soloveitchik, Rupture and Reconstruction. Many of you may be familiar with this article. In it, uh, Dr. Soloveitchik argued that there's a newfound halakhic scrupulousness that comes with the transition from Europe to America, from the old world to the new. Much halakha in the old world is mimetic. It was transmitted within the family from mother to daughter, from father to son, or something along those lines. Um, but homebound halachic practice, that, that link was severed with the destruction of European Jewry, and we're much more text-based. We're focused on texts to determine our religious practice. Um, if you look at what I've quoted here in, in, in source number one, if I were asked to characterize in a phrase the change that religious Jewry has undergone in the past generation, I would say that it was the new and controlling role that texts now play in contemporary religious life. And he continues here and specifically talks about our topic in just a sentence. One of the most striking phenomena of the contemporary community is the explosion of halachic works on practical observance. Skip a few lines down where he has, um, I refer um, in like, let's see how many lines is this? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven lines down. I refer rather to the publication on Talat and Tefillin works on the daily round of prayers and blessings in synagogue and home, tomes on high holiday, and on Passover observance, books and pamphlets on every imaginable topic. So he specifically calls out one of the areas where we see this explosion of text is with regard to Pesach guides. And this is how he describes it. The vast halachic corpus is being scoured, new, doctrine, new doctrines discovered and elicited, old ones given new prominence, and the results collated and published. Abruptly and within a generation, a rich literature of religious observance has been created. And this should be underscored, it focuses on performances Jews have engaged in articles they have used for thousands of years. So people have been keeping Pesach forever, but it's only recently that we've seen this proliferation of text regarding how exactly do you keep Pesach, of which Rabbi Blumenkrantz's guide is a prime example. Uh, and, he can, and he continues on this vein and talks about how all over the Jewish world, he says in the end, B'nai Brak, Borough Park, but also in Kiryat Shmuel and Tinek, maybe places that have a slightly more modern Orthodox um, 
um, identification are using these guides. And this is kind of becoming a very important part of religious observance in, in our current contemporary landscape. So the question I'd really like to discuss here is that when it comes to Pesach guides, how true is Dr. Soloveitchik's argument? Do we see that with the proliferation of Pesach guides, halacha of Pesach is actually getting stricter? Is, there, is this detail leading to a new way that we view the holiday? And what I kind of want to argue is that I think the textualism that Dr. Soloveitchik describes in this article is still very much alive and well. That has not changed. But I'd like to complicate it a little bit because I don't think actually that is always leading to increased stringency, particularly when it comes to Pesach guides. I think actually in some ways we're going to see that some things have stayed the same throughout the history of these guides, and some things have actually gotten more lenient, and maybe the explosion of guides actually allows a space for more lenient opinions to be voiced. And I've done some research on this um, over, the, over the past few years, and I'd like to share, share that with you. So here is what I found, Rabbi Avram Blumenkrantz's original Pesach Bulletin. This is before, so he, he's a shul rabbi, or he was, he was a shul rabbi. Um, his shul was based Medrash at Teres Yisrael in Far Rockaway. And he always put out a Pesach guide in his shul bulletin every year. And now this is not, not surprising. Rabbis do this all the time. Shuls put out today as well, and, and before um, rabbis put out, you know, specific halacha guidance for their congregants on issues related to Pesach. In fact, if you go to Yeshiva University's archives, and they actually have this online now, you can look at all the shul bulletins from like, like shuls in mostly in the New York area from like the early 20th century even. Um, and it's really just, it's like, a, it's like a, kind of an interesting read to see the types of concerns that are being raised there. And the fact that this guidance is, is a pretty, pretty, uh, you know, old concept. Like this is not really a new thing for a rabbi to put out a shul book. But I want to want to show you what I want to show you first about Rabbi Blumenkrantz's bulletin is I think it's kind of different than a lot of other bulletins that you might see from this time. Remember, this is 1977. It's very detailed. Let me just give you like a small small example of this. Um, here, here's here's what he says about what you might do about baking pans and cookie sheets. And these are these are chame, you know things with chametz on them. Oh, I should I should mention also this is, this is an important disclaimer here too that I'm not giving halacha guidance in this class. Not only am I not really qualified to do so, but my point is really to show the history of the Pesach guide. So I don't want anyone to get confused and think like, oh, you know, this is how I should prepare for Pesach now. Or uh, it's always good to ask a local a local rabbi or or or, or other authority um, that, that that you trust for that or for that kind of guidance. Um, so this is what Ari Blumenkrantz has to say about baking pans and cookie sheets. He says a simple way to remove the baked on chametz is to place the corner of the cookie sheet or baking pan over a flame for several seconds, thereby transforming all chametz to charcoal. Or tape may be placed over those stubborn spots and the pan confined with the rest of the chametz, preferably in a separate room. What's really interesting about this is he's not, this is not something you're trying to kosher for Pesach. You're not trying to kosher and use this cookie sheet. This cookie sheet is being put away. It's not going to be used over Pesach. But still, he's telling, he's giving you a very detailed, and I might say kind of strict approach for how to even prepare it to be ready to put away for Pesach. Um, and, 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 I, and I think I think it's kind of interesting to see this level of detail. I, I've looked at other shul bulletins, and you don't see this kind of detail in them at this time. This, this is really something new. Turning to the next page of the source sheet, he does something similar with regard to medicines. And Pema, some of you are probably familiar with Rabbi Blumenkrantz's medicine guide. And this was really like a really new thing at the time. Like Noah, he did all this in research. He went to all these different companies. He looked at all these different types of medications. And he said, this is okay for Pesach. This isn't okay for Pesach. And he's giving you a really, really long, uh, long explanation here. And actually, I see there's a nice little red arrow here. And it's actually pointing exactly to the right place. Because what I want to just mention is not only you'll see already something, another trademark of Rabbi Blumenkrantz here. Because he's not only he's not only talking about Pesach. Look what he has to say, birth control or hormone, hormone control in the, in the middle there. And he says, it is prohibited for any Jew or Jewess to practice any birth control method without having asked the Shaila or receiving permission from a competent halacha authority. Otherwise, the use of the controls in violation of Das Torah and halacha. So this is not about Pesach at all. This is a general piece of halacha guidance that he's offering in his bulletin. And this is kind of a trademark of what Raya Blumenkrantz did, uh, did as well. Again, I'm not saying yay or nay on what, whatever he's saying here. It's just interesting that he's putting this in his, in his Pesach guide. Um, and there's, yeah, there's really nothing comparable to this at the time. 
And now in 1981, as I mentioned at the outset, right, Blumenkrantz took this guide nationwide. And every year there was a new one. And every year, and this continues to this day, it says, discard the previous years. I've got, got a whole new guide for you to look at because it's been updated. Um, it's very comprehensive, tends to be very strict. Um, Rabbi Blumenkrantz unfortunately passed away in 2007, but because of the guide's popularity, his children are still putting it out today. Um, and the Jewish press actually, I believe, what, when Rabbi Blumenkrantz passed away, the Jewish press said, uh, what was the language? It said that it was relied on by tens of thousands of families in the single halacha bestseller of all time. So it really had a tremendous impact on the way people kept Pesach for a very, very long time. Just to give a few more examples to highlight the way Rabbi Blumenkrantz used like talked about talked about things for Pesach. And you can get sort of get a sense of his style uh, and how he approached issues. He talks about packing peanuts. Up until now, packing peanuts were produced from a petroleum-based styrofoam. Today, orders may be packed with soluble peanuts. Just hold them over the faucet and they will be gone before you know it, unlike petroleum-based peanuts that overflow in landfills for generations. Made from corn and wheat, the new peanuts do not have a trace of chemicals that could hurt the environment when they dissolve. Therefore, one should not possess them on Pesach and surely not dissolve them in the Pesach the sinks of the house. So he's got not only an opinion about whether using the pack, how to use the packing peanuts on Pesach or not, or in this case, not to use them, but a really detailed investigation about how they were made and what they're based on and stuff like that. It's just really interesting to see these details. Or look at the next quote I have. I just, this is just random selected things I've taken from the guys over the years. Cleaning tips. This is not even like, you know, halacha of Pesach again, but it's just a general cleaning tip. Shine your chandelier in a flash, turn it off, spray layers of newspaper beneath it, and then spray with an ammonia and water solution. Again, 50-50 mixture works best. The dirt will drip away, clean off any dirt streaks with a soft cloth. So very detailed again, uh, interesting, kind of just general Pesach advice. Um, you want to hear some more general Pesach advice, turn to the next page. This, this, is, this is a bit of a, a silly one maybe, but, but an issue again on Pesach that right, Blumenkrantz feels the need to address, constipation. We suggest that those who suffer from constipation should eat whole wheat matzos. Whole wheat is rich in fiber, which could relieve constipation. You could also use prune juice, kosher the Pesach, or eat papaya. So we've got some very general suggestions here of, of what, what you can do. And this is really very characteristic of, of his guide. And this is part of the reasons why it's over 600 pages. Uh, there's just so many different suggestions. There, He has suggestions in there. If we go, go, want to go on a Cholomoy trip, what kind of Cholomoy trip might be good in the area? What's a kind of a kosher entertainment for a for, from person? He has sections, a whole section of how to check for shotness. I think he felt at some point that there weren't enough good guides about shotness. So he's like, let's put that in there too. What electric shavers are permissible? That gets in the Pesach guide also. Sifre Torah and Mezuzos. If they're written on a silk screen, you shouldn't purchase them. Yoga might be a Vodazara, he suggests. Not a Jewish thing to blow out birthday candles. So you've just got this wide ranging advice that he provides through, through, throughout his guide. And, and, and one might sort of, start to be a little overwhelmed by all by all this information and all this guidance for Pesach. And it's not only him now, like he kind of started it, but there are so many other guides now too. We have the Orthodox Union, the OU, the Star K, the CRC. Um, there's some several books. I believe the COR in Canada puts out a guide every year as, as well. Um, so, so there's really just this proliferation and you kind of might throw up your hands and be like, oh my goodness, things must be getting so much stricter. Look at all this information that's out there. Um, like there's some, even there's some very specific examples of things that we know have gotten stricter. Rabbi Dr. Zev Elif, a few years ago, wrote an article about this actually, about peanut oil. And some of you may remember this used to be peanut oil was like what people bought on Pesach. That was considered the oil that was good for Pesach. And, and for various reasons, it's, it's no longer acceptable. So this is, that's a very good uh, concrete example of something that's getting stricter. But what I want to argue in the next part is maybe uh, it's not all so simple as this linear approach from less strict to more strict. Anyway, let me pause here and just take a few questions if there are any. And I guess we'll look at the chat first. So there was a question about uh, about uh, in the Sephardi Pesach guys. And unfortunately, I don't, I don't know. I haven't, I have not Maybe it's something I should look at at some point. It probably is, but I have not. I have not looked at, um, at at what was going on in the Sephardic communities in America, and I haven't looked at at other countries um, as well. Yeah. Does anyone else have any question at this point? Okay. Let me let me continue a little bit. I want to do a little more history. 
Um, and then after the history, we'll get into some very specific examples. Um, so where did, where did Pesach guides start? What, what's sort of the history of this? I mentioned there were shul bulletins, but then there was sort of a more formal generalized guidance as well that wasn't limited to shuls. Uh, it really starts actually with the women's branch of the Orthodox Union. The women's branch of the Orthodox Union is a very interesting group in general because they actually were the, really the first to start, um, they were really behind the OU's um, entry into the kosher's market in general and, and certifying products. And they also were the ones to publish the first Pesach guide. If you look at this early one I found in the archives in Yeshiva University, this is from 1933, the source number four, and it's, it's a list of foods. It, it's kosher for, it's kosher, it's kosher for Pesach foods, sour cream, cottage cheese, butter, and it just gives you some basic information. Um, there were also longer OU guides throughout the 50s and the 60s that started providing more detailed halacha guidance, but nothing is really so detailed until you get to the 70s and the 80s. First, you had Rabbi Shimon Eider. Um, some of you may have seen his guides as well. He started actually with a series of cassette tapes that detailed the laws of Pesach, and he wrote companion books to go along with those cassette tapes in the late 70s and early 80s, um, and later turned into a modern one-volume book. Then you have Rabbi Blumenkrantz's guide that we talked about. And we also talked about how they seem to be getting more comprehensive. And Pesach, which was classically something done in the home, it loses kind of its mimetic tradition, and it starts to become more focused on details and specifics, which is what's going on with these Pesach guides. The OU, however, didn't have a lot of very robust guidance at this time. The OU kind of was publishing a very small guide. But you'll notice that about 20 years ago, that started to change. Um, the OU started putting out a much more robust guide. For example, in 2005, the OU put an akashring primer into their guide, like how are you going to kosher your kitchen for Pesach? And that's, I think, when you start to see this trend towards strictness that we've documented up until now begin to be reversed. Here, let me just give, throw out some examples, not on the source sheet, but how do you kosher a microwave? All right, Blumenkrantz says, you, sure, kosher a microwave, take a glass of water, put it in the microwave, and heat it for an hour. That's a long time. The OU says, Put the glass of water in the microwave, heat it for 10 minutes. Rabbi right, Blumenkrantz says, if you're going to get paper towels, only certain brands are allowed for Pesach. The OU says, don't worry about paper towels. Rabbi right, Blumenkrantz, as we pointed out, has a very comprehensive medicine list. Um, OU says, not really necessary. If you're swallowing a pill, which is in many cases that's what you're doing, there isn't the chametz concern. You're not eating it. That's not considered derech achila. It's not the way of eating. You don't have to worry about, about whether the pill is kosher le Pesach. You have other new guides. You have Rabbi Eliezer Malamed, who wrote, writes Penine Halacha. He's an important postdoc in Israel. His work has been translated into English as well and is widely used. Um, he will, he'll tell you, for example, actually, you know, for Pesach, you can even cash your dishwasher. This is something the OU typically has not promoted in their guide in recent years, although there was a period where they were doing it, but that's a different story. But anyway, he, sa he, says, he, sa he says you can do that, and he'll give you a bunch of ways you might be able to cash your dishwasher. Also, Something else to point out, in addition to sort of just this basic shift from sort of the OU becoming more prominent and putting out a guide that has a lot more leniencies than Rabbi Blumenkrantz or Rabbi Malame putting out a guide, uh, you also have the internet now. And there's just so much information available online. In fact, you could go, if you wanted to, and to a particular shul, you know the rabbi probably has some more lenient opinions, you can download his guide and you can take a look at that too. And, and the rabbi might even distribute his guide throughout the internet. Um, so you just have this ability for what might have been more localized guidance to become much more prominent nationally, but also the national guidance itself, like we saw from the OU, is considerably more lenient uh, than, than Rabbi Blumenkrantz. And I also don't want to suggest that we're talking about like major changes. It's not like the OU came along and said, you know, we're going to completely change the way everyone was, everyone was doing Pesach based on Rabbi Blumenkrantz. Now we're going to come along, we're going to change it, we're going to make it like super lenient. No, we're talking about mild, minor kinds of things, kind of like the things I mentioned, like how long do you boil the water in your microwave? Something like that. Do you have to replace your, your stove knobs for Pesach? Do you need to get do you need to get a new telephone receiver, which is something Ray Blumenkrantz said at one point that you should act, you should actually, because you're because your your mouth is very close to the headset. So for Pesach, you should get a new telephone. So the OU is not going to tell you to do something like that. So so I think that once other organizations like the OU or even like the CRC or something like that or the COR like jump into this game and start providing guidance, we have a more a more broad spectrum of opinions, not that halach, let's change again, but a broad spectrum of opinions available to the average person uh, to, to guide them, to, to guide them in, the, in their Pesach preparations. 
So I, I think that's sort of kind of a basic argument for this idea that maybe we're not seeing such a tremendous shift in recent years towards greater stringency, but if anything, we're seeing a shift where more where guidance that is more uh, moderate is available to um, to people. Um, okay, let me pause again. Um, I don't see any new questions in the chat, um, but if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, happy to consider some at this point. I have a, a comment and a question. Um, yeah. About, about a year ago, somebody spoke about um, uh, peanut oil and said that really what happened was that Rocaire was the, I think it was, was the last to be also uh, producing it and it wasn't making money, so they stopped. Um, so oh, that's interesting. I mean, Dr. Elif has a whole article on this. I, I can't remember exactly um, everything he said in the article, but I, I do believe he said that uh, at least some of it was what was a change sort of where the Hasidic rabbis who felt that it was not appropriate to be used, unlike Ramosha Feinstein, who felt it was appropriate to be used, their position gained more prominence. But I could also see that like at a certain point, once that opinion gains prominence, then yeah. the producers of the peanut oil are going to be like, well, this is not making money anymore. So they, they just withdraw it. Are you going to talk about uh, sesame seeds? That's I'm not going to talk about sesame seeds specifically. Um, uh, when, I, when I was a kid, one of my Pesach memories was kosher Pesach sesame candy. candy. And now all of a sudden, even though you're, it's asur to, to be mosif al, al um sesame seeds are now kidnapped, and they didn't used to be. Right. So kidney oil is a really interesting issue I'm not going to talk about specifically here, but there's kind of been different trends on kidney oil, I think, over the years. On the one hand, we do see this idea that, like, I think, as you're saying, like, certain things that were not kidney oil are now considered kidney oil, but I think we see opposite trends, too. Like, for example, quinoa is a good example of that. Quinoa... It wasn't around the old days. It wasn't around the old days. When it, when it, first, when it, first, came, when it first came around, there was a lot of suspicion toward it, and generally, most of the guys did not recommend it. The star, um, I think uh, the star K was an early adopter of it and said, this is okay to use, but the OU didn't come around until just a few years ago. Uh, that's that's my understanding. So we do see though, like sort of a, I don't know if it's a trend in the opposite direction, but again, like there there is, uh, and that in Israel also, which is really interesting, and I'm not like on the ground there, so I don't know all the details of what's going on. There's been a tremendous move toward being more lenient about kidney out. I think there's a lot of that is very specific to the Israeli situation because of a very large uh, Sephardi population there. There's a lot more products that are produced in the supermarket that are labeled as lo'och, like kidney oat, only for those who eat kidney oat. But then if you're in an area where there's just so many of those products, it can become like a hardship to actually shop for Pesach. So there are rabbis now, um, ma mainstream, you know, Orthodox rabbis, Ashkenazi, poskim, who, who are saying that it's, it's okay in certain situations to have certain mixtures of kidney oat, which is really, Alpi halacha, my understanding is that that really is okay. Like as long as the kidney oat is not the majority, there's definitely room for some, some leniency and stuff like that. Again, not to get into a specific halachic discussion of this, but 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 I think you do see some interesting trends about kidney oat there. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. It's a comment specifically about sesame seeds and uh, and sesame oil. If I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken, I believe it was a situation that Rav Kook Zetzal dealt with uh, very. Uh, specifically and um, to uh, you know very deeply uh, early on in uh, in times of, of shortage and so on in Eretz Israel and I believe there's a, a lot of literature on that situation and on that shuva that Rav Kook that's all gave. Well, thank you. I really appreciate. It. I really appreciate Hello. those resources. Um, in, yes. in 2006, the chief mm -hmm. rabbi of Israel on television. On, on television said that for Pesach, we now keep kitniot, that the state of Israel is kitniot. I heard it with my own ears and my Hebrew is pretty good. And nobody in Hutza Aritz believes me, but it's the absolute truth. That's what they said mm -hmm. in 2006 when I was there. Say it again. The, 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 chief the, rabbi the, Metzger, the chief rabbi of Israel, went on television mm -hmm. and said for Pesach uh, 2007, we are now using kidney oat for uh, officially from the state of Israel. Didn't mean you have to, a yes, lot of Americans yes. didn't, but the, right. for the reasons you said, because yes. it's a very Sephardi country, as we can mm -hmm. see with all of what's going on now, I'm not gonna get into it, you know, the other stuff, but the, the state of Israel, kidney oat is okay. It doesn't mean you have to do it, but mm -hmm. you can, you know. 
So that I think that's very good. It shows that it's a political state and not just a diaspora community. That's my own view. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I do recall that that statement that, that the chief rabbi made. Yes. Um, um, okay. I, I did want to just say one thing that mm -hmm. sure. many, many years, um, I was half chokingly under the impression that Rabbi Blumenkrantz was working for the American Hotel Association because the difficulties that he made for keeping Pesach made a lot of women turn to their husbands and say, take me away. And I think that that was tragic in a way because uh, of the fact that I think there's nothing more beautiful than a home Seder. And unfortunately, I think it became so difficult that some people uh, felt it was overwhelming. That's interesting. I, the truth is, right, Blumenkrantz was very against Pesach hotels. He did not want people to be going away. He felt that the kashras just could not be trusted. Um, even if it was run by a major organization, he felt there was too much room for problems. There was too much room for oversight um, in, in the kashras, and he really didn't want people doing it. And he wanted people at home also for some of the same reasons you say. So he's, he, if his guides made people do that, it certainly was not his intention. Um, but but I, I, I do want to talk a little bit toward the end, actually, about hotels, because I think we do see something interesting about some of those shifts. And, and I'm not necessarily sure it's because it became too overwhelming to do at home. But I'll talk about, let me talk about that toward the end. Um, okay, so what I want to do for uh, the rest of the time is I want to give three specific examples um, and discuss them a little bit more in depth. One of the examples is going to be something where I think you see a clear shift toward a more lenient view in the guides themselves. Number two is a case where, despite what people think, halacha guidance has stayed the same for 50 years. And number three, I want to talk a little bit about technological and social changes um, to the way we keep Pesach that may sort of just demonstrate a bit of a shift toward an outlook that doesn't see Pesach as, um, I don't know, as overwhelming is the right word, but just sees it in a slightly different light. So let me talk first about uh, the size of chametz you need to worry about when cleaning for Pesach. Now, as we know, chametz, you cannot eat chametz on Pesach. Um, even what the Gemara calls a mashahu, any amount, is forbidden. The question is, when you're looking around your house, do you have to worry about little crumbs? Because that's different than if you're not going to come to eat them. Let's say they're not in the kitchen, they're not in the dining room, they're not in an area where you're going to come to eat them on Pesach. Do you need to worry about cleaning all, all the little crumbs? So when I was little, at least, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but still, I think generally what I heard was like, yeah, sure, you have to worry about every single little crumb. Here's, here's a little, here's a children's book, Just a Week to Go by Yeshara Gold, um, a One Boy's Pesach Preparations in Jerusalem's Old City. I, I had this book as a kid, so it came to mind when I was thinking about this topic. And what does it say over here? Again, it's a kid's book, not a halacha guide. Um, but what's he doing on this page over here, the little boy? He says, I take out my swarm one by one and check every page. Abba showed me how to blow on each page to get out the tiniest crumbs. So he, he's checking every page of, of, of the books because you can't have even any kind of crumb of chametz. That seems to be the, that seems to be the implication uh, of this book. Um, now, what's interesting though, I also, maybe some of you are familiar with uh, A.B. Rottenberg and his album's Journeys. So he's got a song there uh, in the early 90s. Here comes Pesach blues. And one of the lines is there, but my heart is pounding and my brain feels numb thinking about those tiny crumbs. A woman is just very, very overwhelmed about preparing for Pesach. You know, we're worried about the tiniest crumbs again. What's actually interesting though, is when the halacha talks about, do you have to be worried about the tiniest crumbs on Pesach if you're not going to come to eat them? It's not, it's not so clear that's the case. The Shulchan Aruch, for example, talks about a case where you have um, bits of dough in a pan. So here's what the Mishnah Brura, the Chavetz Chaim, the early 20th century halachic authority has to say about that. He says, the davka kishayesh ben akol kezayis. When the Shulchan Aruch says you have to worry about these crumbs on the pan, that's if altogether it's a kezayis. It's like an olive bowl size. The asa klim because then the dish is going to combine them because it's all in one dish. If you don't have a kezayis between everything, ein sarach levaro, you don't need to worry about getting rid of it. He says, okay, there's a disagreement about that. Are there are poskim that say that even less than a gazayas, you do need to get rid of before Pesach. But he says, but that's only if there's at least some ability to eat it. 
Avoim hayim at two naf kitzas. If it's a little bit dirty, you pachas mikazayis, and it's less than a kazayis. Ain sarach levar lekuliyama. Then everyone would agree. You don't have to worry about that. So the Mishnah Brewer is basically saying that we're talking about cleaning the house. If we're talking about some dirty crumb, you know, behind the refrigerator or even even in the bedroom or something like that, you know, if, even even if presumably it's in plain sight, it's not such a big deal. Like no one's going to come to eat that. It's less than a kazayis. We do not need to worry about it. Um, but this was really kind of not the approach that the guides generally took in the early years. Here's something from Yeshiva University from 1955, on source number seven. All chametz in one's possession should be collected and placed in a spare room, closet, or trunk and locked up the day on which Passover Eve falls at the time designated by the rabbi. All chametz dishes and utensils after being thoroughly scoured and cleansed should also be placed in a special closet or room until after Pesach. So this is really interesting. You're, you're putting away these dishes. You're not, not, you're not going to get to whether you're selling the dishes or not. That's a whole complicated issue, um, whether you can sell chametz dishes. But, but in any event, uh, you're putting them away. They're not going to be around on Pesach. You're not going to see anything. But the OU makes a, the, why you makes a, why you and the OU make a specific uh, point that you have to clean these dishes anyway before you put them away. All right, now maybe, okay, you, you have like a dish that's like a really, really dirty pot. I would say, yeah, but you're not going to put away your pot when it's really dirty anyway. So it's just interesting that the that the OU feels the need to tell you in any event, you still have to thoroughly scour and cleanse it, um, as if we're concerned about the little bits of chametz that might that might still be on the pot. Um, and this was a pretty mainstream guidance at, at this time period. Um, but then something changed. And I've traced the change back to an article based on the teachings of Rabbi Chaim Pinchas Scheinberg, Rosh Hashiva of Torah Or um, in, in Yerushalayim. And it appeared in this Kashras magazine, which was a trade publication uh, of, 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 of various Kashras organizations in 1993. And Rabbi Scheinberg had an article there, you can see in source number eight on the left side, clean for Pesach and still enjoy the Seder by Harav Chaim Pinchas Scheinberg. And this article I think was really actually a watershed moment in the way English language guides approach cleaning for Pesach, because he provided some leniencies that then got copied and passed down throughout all the other guides, pretty much. So here, here's one example, just based on what we were just talking about before on the right side here. He says, it is not the intention here to abolish minhagim, which have been passed down by Klai Yisrael from generation to generation. Nevertheless, some practices adopted by women in the Pesach cleaning today are not an actual continuation of the old minhagim. For example, a person does not sell his chametz, of course, it's necessary to check his utensils and to wash off any chametz left on them, or another the chametz inedible. The chametz is sold, then washing the pots, pans, and dishes, which are going to be locked away, um, is, is not necessary. Um, one might be tempted to insist on doing um, the extra work anyway to be machmir. However, in these stringencies lies the grave danger of causing many laxes and brushing aside many mitzvahs completely. Torah rabbinic obligations, which women are required to do on Pesach, and particularly during the Seder. Again, I don't want to get into the specifics about whether you're selling selling the thing or not, but he is providing a leniency here that we're not. There's no need to. There's no need to actually um, get rid of uh, chametz that's left on your dishes if you're putting your, if you're putting your dishes away. Um, and, you know, adopting some kind of stringency, even though, as we saw, the Mishnah Baruch says it's less than a gazayis, you don't need to worry about it, is, is not a conducive way um, to, to, make, to make Pesach. And again, it's, it's kind of very gender focused because there is this thing that the women are the ones that are doing all the Pesach cleaning. Um, but in any event, I, I think he's saying that sometimes people are just overwhelmed. Um, he, in, elsewhere in the article, he says the pressure, pressure of pre-Pesach cleaning has reached unnecessary and overwhelming le levels. Um, and he talks about how maybe in prior days, either they had a dirt floor, so they didn't, I don't know if there was much, they had much less possessions, it wasn't as difficult to clean, or maybe they had more cleaning help or something like that. Um, and he says that nowadays, though, we really have to try to lower people's stress level, we really have to try to make Pesach cleaning easier. And you can see a little bit how, how these, um, how this opinion of Rabbi uh, Scheinberg percolated down to other levels. Here's an article in source number nine from H.com around the year 2000. Rabbi Yitzchak Berkovitz, Passover Cleaning How-To Guide. He says, the only kind of crumb that's problematic is one you'd pick up with your finger and put on your tongue. So leftover crumbs on the table are in fact chametz. Leftover crumbs on the floor, which you wouldn't eat, are garbage. Therefore, any crumb that you find you would consider dirt and is smaller than a kazai, it does not, need, does not have to be gotten rid of. So he's basically just following the Mishnah Brewer there. But this is not something that you saw in the early guides. Um, this is really something you really start to see a proliferation of in the 90s and particularly in the 2000s. Um, and, 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 and you really didn't see that before. Um, and remember Shlomo Aviner from the Religious Zionist Community in Israel also writes an article in 2014. He says, his article is called, How to Do Your Pesach Cleaning Happily in Less Than One Day. 
where he also mentions that it's less than a kazayat, don't worry about it. Rabbi Eliezer Malamed, who we mentioned before, agrees. And you won't find this in the older English guidance, but you'll see it very, uh, very frequently in the newer English guidance. This is kind of an example where not that halacha has changed, but that the guides are saying rely on the more lenient opinion of the Mishnah Bura and others that you don't have to worry about if it's smaller than a kazayat. So this is, I think, one concrete example of where we actually see modern day guys in some respects becoming more lenient. Uh, let me pause here briefly again for questions. Uh, here's a, okay, a couple, a couple of comments here. Yeah, um, yeah, hotels, we'll talk about that. Um, Chabad Riesler said you had to get rid of your vacuum cleaner bag. I, I've seen that too. I think Rabbi Blumenkrantz might say something sim, uh, similar. I uh, haven't looked into that issue specifically though. But I, I'm not. I'm not sure if it would be something that would be, that would be worried about in the modern guys. Again, we're talking about very small particles that are less than a kazayat, presumably, and not in an area where you're going to eat them. So again, not poskening, but I would imagine some of these newer resources might not be so worried about that. Is the olive bigger at the seder than the one used for cleaning your house? So we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about that. That's going to that's going to actually be the next issue about the size of the olive for eating matzah uh, at the seder itself. Um, any any further questions before I continue? Okay, I will go on. Um, okay, so this is a, that was example number one, something that seems to have gotten a little more lenient in the guides over time. Uh, so example number two, something in the guides that has really stayed the same over time, even though people typically talk about it getting a lot stricter. So this is. Source number 10, the Kazayat chart. Let's first look actually here at this picture, sizing up the Seder. This is a chart from a modern OU guide. I don't, don't remember which year, year it is, but it's a very recent one. I'm sure the same chart is in the guide the OU just put out this year. Tells you the size, how big. We talk about uh, the fact that you have to eat an olives bulk or a Kazayat of matzah and maror at the Seder. Um, sometimes it's sometimes it's two Kazayat, depending on which part of the Seder it is and which mitzvah you're filling. Don't really need to get into that. Right now, but in any event, um, all, it, it also talks about you know how a reviet you have to drink a reviet that's a measurement of a fluid measurement of wine at the seder. Um, so the OU has a handy chart here it tells you how big it needs to be. You see like the marar leaves pretty big, eight by ten inches matzah pretty big. Um, so people like to some of these, you know people sometimes look at this chart and be like eh, you know that's an awful lot. I don't really think that people ate that much. Like you know people like talk about how like you know the chavos chaim he had a he had a wine cup, it was much smaller than, than the cups we use now, and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so, so I think the chart sometimes causes a little bit of angst among people about the sizes of matzah and maror and wine that you're supposed to consume at the Seder. But what I thought was interesting, so this is the contemporary chart, but when I went to the, I went to the YU library a few years ago, from 1976, I found what I think is the original uh, Pesach chart, and it's exactly the same. So at least in that time frame, there doesn't seem to have been much of a change. Um, yeah, you might wonder, and I think it's a it's a good question. Is so, but where did these sizes come from? These like the, the chart must have come from somewhere. Right? Whether it's 1976 or 2022, uh, the chart came from somewhere. So I did a little more research on this, and and I think that the answer is is actually Rav Moshe Feinstein's son, Rav David Feinstein, was the first to use these sizes. He had a safer and source number 11 here, he had a safer called Kodo D. And in this safer, he basically, what he wanted to do is he wanted to size up the Seder. He wanted to figure out what are the sizes that people need to use um, um, for the Seder. And if you look at his introduction here, this is what he, this is how he explains what he's doing in this book. He says, uh, source number, uh, source number, source number 11. Tom Hosaba or shall I say for The reason I put out this book People ask me a lot of questions about the Seder. How much is the Kazayat? How much is the olive book? How much is the Reviyat? How fast do you have to eat the matzah? There's like a time limit for like how fast you have to consume the matzah. So how fast do you have to do that? What's the custom here or here? So I've decided to make a book of all the sizes, so you don't have to keep asking about it. Now, you don't, you don't have to follow this. Like, if you have your own custom that contradicts what I'm saying, follow it. 
Those customs have a lot of um, antiquity to them. They have a lot of importance to them. If you don't have a custom of yourself, I wrote to list uh, You want to rely on me? Um, that's fine. And I've explained the source for all these customs um, and and the rationale behind them. Um, and then he, if you, I just gave one example. He talks about how he did various measurements, how he like put them. He displaced the amount of water for measuring the size of the kazayat. Um, he looked at the measurement of the ravine. He looked into various sources, and he comes to very specific conclusions in the safer. For example, in this paragraph I've highlighted here, shear ha romaine lettuce. What's the size of the romaine lettuce? But alin, if we're hierakos, if we're talking about the leaves, who ate al ten inches, eight by ten inches, same as we saw in the chart. If we shedra to alin, we're talking about the stalks, three by five inches, um, and that's exactly what it says in the chart. You have the mara eight by ten. If romaine stocks enough to fill three by five area, this is directly from Rabbi David Feinstein's Rabbi David Feinstein's Sefer, and this is very much in line, just parenthetically, with what Rabbi David Feinstein was trying to do in general. He, he's been described kind of as the everyman's gadol, that um, that he really wanted to try to make right. He didn't write a lot of svarim, and what he did, it was very practical, or something he even wrote on the parsha in English. Um, because he really wanted to make halacha available and accessible to people, which is a which is a very worthy a very worthy goal. Um, so I think I think we can see here at least is at least since 1970 we've had a pretty standardized set of sizes for what to eat at the seder, um, according according to Rav David Feinstein, and then in the guides and in the charts, and it hasn't really and it hasn't really changed. Like that that's kind of become very accepted, um, and it's been you know quite a while now. You're going to tell me still, all right, it's still a very big size. That's not probably not what they were eating originally. And yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that as well. There's been a lot of debate about this, like how these sizes came to be. I'm not going to go into the whole halachic discussion, of which I'm probably fuzzy on some of the aspects um, anyway. Um, but there has been also a contemporary move to saying that maybe these sizes are too big and we don't really need to worry about them as much. And you might think, oh, this is something that's kind of fringe. Um, no, it's not fringe though. Um, here's something from the OU guide in 2020. So very mainstream OU Pesach guide. This is a Rebbe Hadar Margolin um, in Israel. And he says in source number 12, the reason we have become accustomed to consuming so much matzah is of course, to presume halachic size of the kazayat. Conventional wisdom has come to accept this as quite large and the result is an amount that many people find challenging. I'd like to present another side to this halacha and offer a per perfectly legitimate alternative. Accordingly, when seeking to define the size of Gazayat, I need look no further than my local olive tree. That and that alone is the determining factor. Simply stated, olive equals olive. Uh, and he has a whole article in there in that guide where he goes through the sources about why he thinks that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do, just to use the size of an olive. Again, not asking here, but the perspective is out there, even in the OU guide, you know, a very mainstream source. Um, by Natan Slifkin, uh, some of you may be familiar with. Um, wrote a whole article about a number of years ago also where he concluded that not only does he think that the size of an kazai is the size of an olive and no larger, but that there were contemporary post scheme, including, I believe, uh, the stipler of, of Kanievsky, who said that that was okay um, as well. And then as a little joke, he published here in source number 13, his rationalist matzah and mara chart. And you can see the sizes he thinks you should eat for the Seder. And it is indeed an olive. Um, so again, let me pause and take any questions on or comments on this. Um, are you going to are you going to say? I know you talked about the microwave and the time. Mm -hmm. um, are are you going to say anything else about koshering? Because otherwise, I have a question. I am going to talk a little bit more about koshering. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So let me. I'll continue with that. All right. So let me let me actually get to my third and last example, and this ha does have to do, this does have to do with koshering and some changes. And I'm not going to get into a lot of specifics because it's very confusing. Um, but I, I want to just talk about a broad thing. And again, this is not this one is really not a shift toward leniency so much as like a technological change that I think made Pesach easier that it's worth thinking about. So this is a what I have in source number fourteen is a little gem <laughs> that I found. Um, in a box of uncatalogued Pesach material in the Library of Congress, which is near where I live. And uh, I flipped through it and I found this really interesting thing the OU put out in 1959, and they called it a socio-drama in four scenes. Um, 
And it's basically like a little play that you can act out with your family uh, to figure out what to do for Pesach. Now, is it kind of interesting? I think the history behind this is, to be honest, like in the 50s, like the halachos were not as widely known in the Orthodox community as they are today. And they wanted to bring more people into them. They wanted to make them more available to people. And they felt at the time that making this little play would be, would be helpful to people. Uh, but I want to kind of focus on just one aspect of this. Look at scene number two. Um, this is preparing the home for Pesach, tells you the kitchen in the home of Anne Stein. Her mother, Mrs. Roth, is showing her how to kosher her kitchen for Passover. Um, you know, Mom, I'm really excited. This is the first Pesach that we're spending in my house, and I want everything to go just right. I want Jack to be really proud of me as a balabusta. Okay, and they say it's not as hard as you think. So let's see. Let's see. What do they have to do? It's not so hard. So the mother says, they look at the very bottom lines here. Fine. I think that we might just as well start working on the stove. First, we'll clean it thoroughly. They both go through the motions of scrubbing the stove with an abundance of elbow grease. And then it continues over here. Uh, the daughter says, I never realized that a stove could contain so much accumulated food. Incidentally, Jack should return pretty soon with the blowtorch to finish cleaning the stove. I pity any chametz when he gets to work on it. And the mother says, don't forget to let those flames burn until the burners are glowing. Anne says, all right, mother, I've already ordered the aluminum sheet for the oven top. The mother says, well, my dear, I see that preparing the home for Pesach is becoming easier every year. It's a far cry from the work that we had to do 30 years ago in Europe. I think that you're just about set here. I'm going to go to the rabbi's office, tell the chametz, I'll ask him about your silverware. See you later. Okay. So I think this is, <laughs> I think this is kind of interesting. We, we, we see a few things here. Um, that number one, they have to use a blowtorch to clean the, to clean, uh, to clean the stove or the oven. I'm not, I'm not sure which one they're talking about. Um, if they, maybe, they, maybe they're referring to the oven when they say stove. I'm not completely sure. But in any event, we don't have to do that anymore um, because we have self-cleaning ovens. Um, that's what I think made things a lot easier. Um, my understanding is that it was in 1963 that General Electric invented the self-cleaning oven. Uh, it reaches a temperature of nearly 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit during its self-cleaning cycle. Um, it reduces residue to ash and it coshers the oven without the need for additional cleaning. You, generally, if you have a self-cleaning oven, you don't have to spend hours going over with easy off. You don't have to use a blowtorch. Um, now, of course, there are still people who don't have self-cleaning ovens and some of these procedures are still relevant, but for many people, they're not as relevant anymore. So the kind of elbow grease they're talking about in this little sociodrama are just not, it's not, not quite as common as it used to be. Um, I almost feel like when they say like, it's becoming easier. Uh, I think about how much easier it's become since then. Um, uh, they also refer to a aluminum sheet for the oven top. And I, I could not figure out what this is uh, for a while. I think that most people now uh, use foil. Like they take aluminum foil, they put it around their burners maybe. Um, that's something people do. They don't necessarily buy a whole specific thing, but it seems like at least back then in the 50s and 60s, there was this aluminum sheet you could buy to cover your stove for Pesach. And I think this is it. If you look at the picture in the left-hand corner on the bottom of the source, uh, someone, someone found that in their house for me when I, was, <laughs> when I was searching for it and took a picture of it and sent it to me. And I think that's probably what we're talking about. Uh, I don't know if anyone else uh, has seen this before, but in any event, people don't buy those anymore. Like we've, aluminum foil was around back then, but I guess someone figured out, had a bright idea, hey, like we can just buy this cheap aluminum foil and use it. We don't need to buy a special, a special Pesach stovetop. Um, pretty sure, pretty sure uh, my mom had one of those. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. so I guess I, what I, I, yeah. I have one. I use it. I call it a reverse blech. It just makes it easier. The tin foil rips. That's true. That's true. And and it lasts year from year, so it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, if you have it, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's just like, I I, I don't know if they make these anymore. So, um, but, but, but yeah, I, th I thought that was interesting. Um, so leaving aside that though for a moment, I think, I think what's interesting here is we do see a bit of a shift sometimes also with regard to Pesach that certain things at least have gotten easier. Like we do have self-cleaning ovens, for example. Um, also with regard to products that you can get, gluten-free matzah, which is very necessary for many people, much more available. Ryan Blumenkrantz in the 90s talked about it, but he says you have to order in special, special order from England in small quantities. That was the only place it was available. We have potato bread even now. We have matzo, you know, we have, you go to a rest, some restaurants now and like they serve things that look almost indistinguishable from their chametz equivalents. Um, candy, there's lots of candy. You don't just, 
started with the jelly and fruit slices, but there's so much more availability now. There's so much more products. And I think we were talking about earlier about the lack of certain maybe oils and stuff like that, or other products that have been declared kidneys, maybe sesame oil, um, peanut oil. Yes, like you can complain and say, yeah, it's we shouldn't be getting more strict. On the other hand, there's just so much more stuff available for Pesach. And in some ways it's so much easier to keep uh, that I think part of the reason we have become stricter on certain things is just because of the availability of alternatives. Um, there's also a lot more Pesach hotels. Now, these are very expensive. I, I'm well aware of that. I, I looked into it briefly this year and I saw the price and I'm like, nope, <laughs> not doing that. Um, but, but, but it is something that's much more available today uh, than it was in the early 20th century. There were a few, and there, there always were. I mean, the Catskills and the Borschfeld, as they called it, always had these hotels and these resorts available both year-round and on Pesach. But in 1966, for example, the OU supervised 11 hotels. In 2020, um, I checked uh, before COVID, and there were over 140 um, programs to choose from. Here's just an ad that I received in my email back in 2020. And uh, you can see all the all the all the extras that you get with this program. I even liked, it says over here in the middle, you can see families and singles welcome shadchan on premises. So, you know, you can even, you can even go and find your shidduch now uh, at, at your Pesach hotel. Um, so I think we see sort of this idea that even if certain things are getting stricter by Pesach, there's, an all, there's a counter trend kind of where things are also in some ways more user friendly than they were. And uh, there's more products available, there's more technologies available, uh, there's more resources available to help you in, in, in your journey. So I think kind of the guides can be that two-sided kind of thing where in the one hand, if you look just at Blumenkrantz, you're gonna see a lot of stringencies. If you look at sort of more modern trends in the guides and you look at the general idea of having information available, you could also understand a certain trend toward leniency and moderation, as I've hoped I've shown. Let me just say a couple more words to conclude, and then for the last five minutes, we can take a few more questions. Um, so we talked in the beginning about rupture and reconstruction, and that it posits a trend toward greater stringency as texts and guides increase. I think what we've seen here is that there is not as much a clear linear progression when it comes to Pesach guidance. I think in many ways, rupture and reconstruction is still correct. There is a triumph of a textual tradition or textual guides over a mimetic or home-based tradition. Um, but I think things do kind of come back to the center when we look at the OU guides, which are much more lenient than Raya Blumenkrantz's guide. But I think in large part, we still do see a triumph of this detail-oriented halachic approach that rupture and reconstruction posits, that e whether the guides are strict or more moderate, there is a lot of detail on how to observe Pesach. And I think this is sort of a, there's a double edge to this, as I said, where, where on the one hand, it might seem more overwhelming and more burdensome. On the other hand, it may provide you with uh, certain ideas, um, or even certain leniencies, and just the availability of products can make, can make a big difference. And, and I think because of that, I, I'm not sure about this, and maybe some of you will have much better finger on the pulse of this than I do, but I talked to some people about this a couple of years ago. And a lot of people um, said that, you know, people, people sometimes said that like, in some ways, Pesach felt more different, uh, maybe 50, 60 years ago. Like it felt like you were really had to, there was like a kind of like a, a, a very big change and there wasn't so much available. Like there weren't as many things you could buy and, the, and, and it was a difficult process to costure and everything like that. And, and it, you, you kind of felt almost a sense of, a little bit of a sense of deprivation, which I don't think it really exists today. Um, and, and, and I think there's more of an awareness also about the about the uh, the mental and emotional costs of being too strict when it comes to things like cleaning uh, and and that leading to people getting burned out and not being able to enjoy the Seder properly. So I'm not saying that Pesach doesn't feel overwhelming now um, or anything of the sort. I mean, I can tell you in my house, it's we're already getting a little overwhelmed, just, just the, the thought of preparing and everything we need to do. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think maybe there has been somewhat of a shift about the way we conceptualize Pesach and, and some of the difficulty that it presents and the deprivation that it might present, which kind of ties in also to the, this question of the guides and the way they present the material. And I'll just point out that I published uh, a lot of these findings in an article uh, a few years ago in the Lairhouse where I'm 
where I'm now an editor. I was not an editor at the time I published the article, but you can, if you want more information, you can look at that article there. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. And I am happy to take questions for the next, next few minutes. If I um, could make a, a comment and a question. Yeah. Um, so I think having lived in the sticks, so to speak, um, having grown up in, in the middle of, you know, in a very small Jewish community where we didn't have access to a lot of things, I think a lot depends on where you live, mm -hmm. both, both geographically and hashkafically. Um, okay. so, so that um, I think that the stringencies were always there and the leniencies were always there, but, you know, we have more um, access today to various opinions and publications and all these things. And it, and, you know, which enables you to really, you know, do this research. Um, right. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how much of a shift there is. Um, that's my comment. And, but one of the things that, that sort of bothered me is, um, you know, you talked about self-cleaning ovens mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, you know, I, I think, and, and, you know, I can't swear that there's been a change, but I remember in the old days, you know, I used to clean my oven and when self-cleaning ovens came out or even when they weren't, you know, you cleaned your, you, you kashered your oven and that was it. And, uh, you know, now the guides are saying, um, well, you clean it and then you have to wait 24 hours and then you kasher. I don't know if that's a, I don't know if that's a change or if it's just my ignorance. Yeah, that's a, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I do think that you are right, that there probably is as things get more detail oriented that like, I think originally maybe when the technology came out, we're like, okay, this just takes care of it. Like the halacha is pretty clear, but as things get more detail oriented, people do begin to realize, hey, but there's like this area, maybe the self, like the door of the oven, for example, maybe, like maybe the self clean doesn't reach all areas of that. So there is, it was with well, do some cleaning, but I think you'll find some variation still in the modern guides about how much you have to do in that regard. Um, just to look a little bit through the co comments and I'll, let me try to, let me try to address those in the chat. Um, Okay, a blowtorch. Uh, uh, okay, actually, right. So the question is whether the the chart, um, the the Kazaias chart is for machine made and also handmade, or just or just or just for one. Uh, there are um, I. I'm actually I don't remember. I, I think there is a slight difference in some of the guidance between between how much you have to eat for the different kinds of matzah, but but generally it has to do with the thickness of the matzah. So if it's relatively the same thickness, then it's going to be, it's going to be the same. Blowtorch was used on inside of oven. Thank you. Yeah. Burners were cooked up. Now, yes. Okay. Yeah. Cleaning the door. We talked about that briefly about why maybe the self-cleaning function doesn't, doesn't clean the door. Um, um, what is an LOMI, Matt? Huh? Oh, Matt placed over the whole cooktop. So it's something similar to what I showed, I guess, before. Yeah, and someone says here they don't cover the cooktop, just heat it for the OU. Yeah, I, no, I think that's it's yeah. something, it's something new. Okay, it's, something new. Okay. Somebody somebody showed it to me. It looks like it looks like a cloth mat, but you actually cook right through it. It covers the burners as well as the as well as the around the surrounding area. Okay, yeah. I'm the one that wrote about it. And yeah. essentially it's uh it is sort of it's not quite asbestos, but it is a a fire retardant okay. fabric. And when I spoke to the distributor, he said what he suggests, um, I've spoken to two people, one person that had it, and she suggested that I get the version four. And as I wrote at page 69 in the COR book, there's the mm -hmm. inf information about it. Okay. Um, and you can look online and buy it on Etsy. Um, I bought it from a lady in Toronto who... I didn't have to worry about shipping. Anyhow, long story mm -hmm. short, um, he suggested putting foil under your uh, pot in case it spills over. Otherwise, you have to soak your lomi. We can't take the lomi off the stovetop during Pesach. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't I want see. to have too many stains. So he said, put, put foil on that little area. And yeah. it's, it's like a blech, but it's okay. a fabric. 
Yeah. Okay. So thank you for that information. I, I think just getting back to our our, our discussion of this, I, I think like there are more things like this that are available to, to consumers that they can use, but there are options also. Like, you know, a guide won't necessarily tell you you have to get that anymore. Like it seemed like the OU was saying in the 50s, you really want they really want you to get that whole aluminum thing to cover it, but now they'll give other suggestions about how much you have to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I see, I see people here have different different practices with regard to how they cover their cooktop. Um, it may also depend on what kind of stove you have. People point out whether it's gas or electric or induction or whatever. So sure, yeah, many more. Is a is a point here. Many more oils are available, like avocado oil. Sure, okay, um, okay. Uh, okay, here's a question about gabrachs. We've seen a drift when non gabrachs become a community social norm. Even families that never had that tradition. I, I um, someone may know more about this than I do, but my my sense is that I'm not seeing like individual families necessarily adopting gabrachs. What I am seeing is that when it comes to communal things, such as like a Pesach hotel, for example, that because they want to appeal to the widest spectrum, they are going to make the whole thing non gabrachs. But what I think was also interesting is it, because of the advances and changes in cooking and the availability of various things, like. I, I think even like for a non gabrachs paste like now they can make things, particularly using using potatoes that look and taste a lot more like their hummus equivalents than they used to be able they used to be able to do. Um, let's see, are there any more here? Okay, and that those I think cover the comments. Um, is there any any last last question or comments? Just I think I think as we advance, unfortunately. Pesach is becoming less different uh, from the rest of the year. If you can go yeah. to a hotel or you can go to a restaurant and have Pesach rolls that look just like right. the Pumitz rolls, there's something about Pesach that's missing. And I yeah. think that we need to bring it back. We need Zohoros Hayom Hazeh Asher Yitzhosem Mitzrayim doesn't mean or shouldn't mean that we're free to do anything. It should mean that we're free to remember the chesed of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that comment. I do, in my in my written article, I talk about that a little bit toward the end as well. And I do think there might be a shift in that regard to the way we think about Pesach, which I think brings with it benefits and challenges, as you mentioned. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful way to sort of wrap up because, uh, you know, I'd like, I'd like for as many people to stay on for surely and take a break, but... You know, it's it's finding the balance between the slavery and freedom, right? Right. You know, where where I mean, I, you know, there's something um, there's something about slaving away to get to freedom, and in and in my house, I always say, I, you know, I'm I'm Valchuva, so I didn't grow up uh, preparing this way. I grew up taking the the cabinet of chametz and moving it into a, a different room and a different closet, and and that was, you know, that was that. And so in my house, you know, it really feels like I get very, very low beseder on my way to Seder. And there's something beautiful about that, but only if it can be in a balance. I don't, you know, there's, it feels like so much slavery. So, you know, I think that that's really was the whole point of, of uh, having this wonderful class, um, lovely comments, which you, you obviously didn't read because they weren't questions, but um, I got some private ones as well. Um, so, Yosef, thank you on behalf of Torah in Motion and everybody here um, for, for this wonderful insight. And everybody has access to the sources, um, both in the chat and on the website. But yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to strike that balance. We don't want to see, we don't want to see roles that don't look like, you know, that look like every Friday night, right? Uh, and making this special and separate and reminding us of everything. But uh, but also for me, I don't wanna feel like I'm, you know, literally slaving the whole, the whole time to get there, I guess. So anybody else wanna say anything before we wrap up? Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. I, I really very much enjoyed this. Really interesting, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah, have a chalakash of a samach, everyone.